Talking with Tech is sponsored by Q Interactive, Pearson's iPad-based system for testing, scoring, and reporting. Experience unheard of efficiency and client engagement with 20 top tests, all delivered digitally. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial at pearsonclinical.com slash TWT18. Um, after that 30 days, if you want to go ahead and use it, call 1-800-627-7271 and give them promo code TWT18 to get 10% off the Q Interactive license. Uh, this is only good through the end of the year, December 31st, 2018, so try it now. Well, welcome to Talking With Tech. My name is Chris Bouguet and I'm here with Rachel Madel. How's it going, Rachel? It's going really well. Getting ready for ASHA, Chris. It's coming up. I'm crying. I'm not going, Rachel. But you know where I did go today? I was in two preschool classrooms this morning. It was awesome working with the preschool teachers and those kids. Like They give you energy. You know, I remember uh, back in the day when I was a speech therapist centered at a school, I would just go to the preschool classrooms just to revitalize myself. Like, remember that life is good, you know, that, they, that these kids are all about having fun and, 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 and just playing, you know. I love preschool. It always cracks me up when I, I think about the the stark difference between preschool and middle school. Uh, preschool, you're like a celebrity. You walk in, all the kids are like, "Oh my gosh, Miss Rachel, can I come?" You know, everybody's like tugging at my little my my therapy bag, trying to like hop in and like go to the session with me. Um, you know, then we get to like middle school, and everyone's like, "I don't want to go to speech therapy today." I'm like, um, well, it's not exactly a choice. So like, we're just going to make the best out of it. <laughs> I just think it's so funny. Those preschoolers though, they love it. They love, they love speech therapy. They have such an energy. They, they are not jaded at all, right? They're just the big, huge sponges, just taking in everything that's in their environment. I find too that the preschool teachers that I work with, they're like happy, fun people too. You know, they're, they're always creating things and making new things. And they're sort of like a, the fountain of youth is working with preschool. Absolutely. I um, I started my career actually working in the preschools. I just love that population because they're, they're super cute, first of all. They just kind of say whatever they think, which I really appreciate. You know, and I, I always ask the preschoolers that I work with, I said, oh, like, you know, what do you do when you come work with me? Like, what do we do together? Um, what's speech therapy all about? Um, and they're like, oh, like, you, you, we play games. We eat lollipops. I'm like, <laughs> well, we do a lot more than that. Uh, but it's just so funny to get a kid's take on, like, what are we actually doing here? So what are some strategies or something specific, like resources we could give that are specific to preschool? Well, I'm really excited, actually. We're talking about preschool, and we had Jenna Rayburn Kirk on, who is an SLP, and she works primarily in preschool. Um, she also does fantastic stuff with resources. She is on Teachers Pay Teachers as Speech Room News, and I was so excited to have her on. I use her resources, and I have been for a long time. Um, so she kind of talks about her journey and how she started creating these materials, and I just think it's it's a really, it's a really important discussion to have, you know, because I think that, and she talks talks about I started making these materials out of necessity. I needed resources to use during my therapy and I couldn't find them online. I couldn't find them, you know, in a book. And so I made them. And I feel like we can all at some level relate to that, right? We've all been in a situation where we're like, okay, I'm working with a kid and I need, you know, X, Y, and Z. It's like you kind of scour all of like your resources and you're like, okay, it's not really here. Now what? And you, you kind of just improvise and you make it. Um, and, and that's where, you know, things like board maker and smarty symbols and all of these kind of, um, resources are really valuable because they allow us to create exactly what we need, um, and specific to individual kids, um, and, and their specific interests, which is so awesome. Yeah. You know, I love, you know, I love that whole spirit. Okay. I'm going to go out and try and find it. And if I can't find it, then that means it's on me. I have to create it, you know. It's uh, it's my responsibility to make this thing come into the world. Uh, and it sounds like that she it kind of embodies that spirit as well. And then it really worked and paid off for her, right? Because she is kind of well known in the in that space. She has twenty five thousand followers um, on Teachers Pay Teachers and over four hundred resources, which is crazy, you know. But it's not crazy when you think about, you know, she's been working as an SLP for I think almost ten years, um, and she, you know, she 
loves creating things. I can relate at some level. Um, I don't think I love the laminating and the cutting and all those things, but it is really cool to think about what a child might respond to. I actually make resources and have them on my website. And it's interesting. The process is always for me. I see a need. And for me, it's typically, okay, we need some type of visual support to help this breakdown. Um, and a lot of the kids that I work with, I work with a lot of kids with autism and there's, for whatever reason, there's some type of breakdown going on, whether it's, okay, they don't understand how to build this sentence. Um, I have a, a resource that's called a building sentences board. And it's one of my absolute favorites because it just breaks it down into, you know, kind of subject who, uh, action doing, um, it just kind of gives a formula for creating sentences. And it's so useful. I use it all the time. I was just using it yesterday um, with one of the kids that I work with. Um, and so, you know, when I'm creating a material, first I kind of sketch it out on a piece of paper, like old fashioned style. Um, and I think, hmm, okay, like maybe this would work. And then, you know, go on, figure out what symbols I want and, you know, what kind of borders I need. And, and then the, the most important piece I think is then trying it and using it. Um, Cause a lot of times it doesn't stop with my first design, right? I'm like, oh, it really would be great if, you know, there was a box up here to put the topic of conversation. And so it's just kind of, there's different iterations that you go through. And I think that the biggest thing is you just, you just use it. You use it in your practice and you see what's working, you see what's not. Um, and you can kind of brainstorm as you go on how to expand it and how to make it better. So that's kind of the process that I go through. Cool. So what are some examples? Like something that comes up to my mind that I see in a lot of preschool classrooms are like uh, placemats, you know, that might have picture symbols around them as supports. Uh, that's one that, that comes to mind. Another might be putting picture symbols up in different parts of the room to kind of label the parts of the room and, and not just the picture symbols, but also little um, uh, maybe scripts about what the communication partners might say while you're in this part of the room. Here are target vocabulary you could be using when you're in this play area. Uh, those are two that come to mind. Do you have others? So I actually love the strategy of the vocabulary in different centers. I was working with a little boy years and years ago, and um, there was no visual supports in his classroom, none. And he was using a device, and it was actually one of my first AAC clients. And I was like, you know, it would be really helpful for the staff, right? Like his aide and all these other, you know, communication partners to have some ideas on what things that they can model um, during the center, um, during the animal center. You can, you know, say go and you can have some of the pictures of the animals. And I just think that those visuals are so important, especially for preschoolers. Preschoolers can't read. Um, you know, so it's like we take for granted the fact that we're literate and we can read labels on things. But, you know, for kids, it's just, especially preschoolers, they're really relying a lot on those visual supports. So any way we can give multimodality communication and, and structure, I think is really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing that I'm really interested in is how can we use technology um, in really innovative ways um, in preschool classrooms and beyond? Um, but I think there's a lot of really cool apps that you can use to kind of help create that structure. Um, one of them, so one I use all the time is called ChoiceWorks. And it's just basically a transition schedule, kind of just like the laminated version that you see in a lot of classrooms, um, but it's digital. And the reason I love the fact that it's digital is because you can actually import videos. So we know that video modeling is so important for kids, especially kids with autism. Um, you know, so if they are supposed to go wash their hands, instead of just having a still shot of them washing their hands, you can actually touch it and it plays a video of them washing their hands. Um, so it kind of takes it to the next level, but I, I really find that it helps kids become more independent. And I think that ways that we can incorporate video modeling into the mix, maybe not with washing hands, it feels like you might get some water on the iPad, but, but any way that you can kind of think outside the box in a lot of ways, I think it's really important. It's a really good to think through the lens of how can we use technology to help, to help us in the classroom. Rachel, you're going to love this, right? So I just recently wrote a blog post for USAC. And what the blog post was, was all about teaching coding to students who use AAC, including kids in preschool and kindergarten and younger ages as well. So imagine this, take a, a robot. There are different kind of low price uh, robots you can get. Ozabot is an, is an example. And they work with an app where you can drag, drag these puzzle pieces around to put them in order. So turn, 
go, stop. That's what the different puzzle pieces are, right? And then it commands the robot to do that in the sequence that you have done it. And so the kids can just drag these puzzle pieces and make these little codes for the robot, send it to the robot, and the robot then does what essentially is core vocabulary, you know? Uh, so keep an eye out for that blog post. Maybe we can link to the show notes because it's a, I, I've not heard of other people really playing with robots and coding in a preschool level or really working with AAC at all. But I think it's what you're talking about is this new, interesting way of looking at technology and using the technology that's available. Coding is definitely something that's happening in schools. Why not start at an early age? Yeah, you're, you're tapping into a part of my brain because I was just speaking at an LA conference on apps and autism and not, you know, AAC specific, but one of the apps that I recommended is this really cool app called AR Dragon and it's an augmented reality app. I don't know if you've heard of it, Chris. Dude, I play Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, I've seen the app. Okay, so you know <laughs> AR Dragon then. Um, so yeah. it's really cool. So it's this dragon. It's kind of like a Tamagotchi. You remember those? Those like Tamagotchi pets that everyone had and it was like you had to feed it you had to play with it otherwise it would like you know get really sad and like die so that's what this is it's a dragon though so you can make him eat you can throw the ball and it's so cool because you know for our listeners who aren't sure what augmented reality is basically it is a combination of your real reality right so everything that you see um, but then there's a superimposed image on top of it so you know if I am in my office I can open the app and the dragon pops out and he's on my desk um, you know, and he's, so he's in our, our reality. Um, so it's, it's really cool. Kids are obsessed with it. Um, and of course we can tar target those core words. So eat and, you know, go and more, and he's all done with that. He wants to do something different. Um, but it's like this little pet dragon and, um, it's just a really, really cool game that I, all of my kids have been loving. When I explain AR to people, I often talk about what everyone kind of knows is Snapchat and Instagram filters, you know, that you can superimpose your eyes being really big or shooting laser beams or you open your mouth and rainbow comes spitting out of it, right? And then build, oh, that's augmented reality. And so what you're talking about is a dragon. Quick shout out to Lauren Enders. For, thanks for coming back on the podcast. But she did an exceptional ed course for uh, AAC After Work that was all about using green screen and AR apps. So if you're looking for more, go check out her course on exceptionaled.com. Yes, Learn Enders is fantastic and always is on the cutting edge of all of the newest, latest and greatest apps. And that was a fantastic presentation that she gave. I was there and I watched it live and was so excited because I always walk away with uh, some, some ideas from her. And I would highly recommend our listeners to, to go watch that one specifically. Let, let me jump back to low tech there for a second, because people might be like, I don't have an iPad to dr drop this AR app on. Can, can I just cut stuff with scissors? So here's an, an idea. Once upon a time, there was a strategy, and I think it's still out there, called Buckets of Literacy, where you could put um, a book in a bucket and then all these resources that go along with the book. And one of my colleagues, her name's Judy Schoonover that I work with, um, she's an occupational therapist, and she said, why, why don't we do this for core vocabulary? And so she'd take these shoe boxes and she'd put core vocabulary words on them, let's say like, a, like go, and then she'd put stuff in the box like uh, little race cars and, I don't know, trains and yo-yos and all these other things that go, right? I mean, everything goes, right? But you put it in a box and then you put a little, the symbols that you need to help you teach what Go is, and maybe a little index card with a script that helps the people in case they're a substitute or don't know what to do. But the idea is you could grab this box off the shelf and you have instant activities. You don't have to necessarily even plan. And so she had the Go box, right? But beyond that, imagine having a whole shelf full of core vocabulary boxes, you know, core vocabulary kits, if you will. And uh, they like, they, they were like hotcakes. People loved making them and people loved using them. They still do. I mean, I want to create those for my office. <laughs> I feel like that's just a really smart idea, regardless if you're in the school or not. I'm always scrambling in my bag and like my cabinets for like, oh, I used that one time for, you know, different, <laughs> you know, targeting the word different. So let me try and find that again. Um, but I think having everything organized and easy to access is huge. Um, we know that, you know, when it comes to 
the, the speech therapy that we're doing, if we're practitioners or the teachers um, that are listening, you have to be able to grab something on the fly and just run with it. And I think organizing those things um, not only allows for quick access, but it also just gives ideas. Um, I think that anytime you can spark new ideas on how to use a resource and target specific vocabulary, it's just really, it's a, it's a beneficial learning tool for, you know, teachers or aides who might not be as familiar with core words and how to target them. I, I always think about the fact that, yes, I am a speech language pathologist and this is what I like live, eat and breathe, right? Like communication and language. It's hard for me to step outside of that and realize that, you know, it wasn't always natural for me, right? It, like when I was first learning how to be, you know, a speech language pathologist, it was always kind of intuitive. And I remember learning things and being like, oh, that makes sense. Uh, but I still had to learn them. Um, so I think we, we have to remember that when we're working with teachers and aides, because it's so important to give them the tools to be successful. Rachel, you mentioned teachers pay teachers. I have to be honest, that's not a resource that I've ever utilized as a professional, meaning I've gone there and searched it, but I haven't put my stuff there. Do you have like a store there? How, how does it actually work? So actually, what's funny is that we, I get a lot of emails from our listeners who I think at one point Lucas had said that I had a teachers pay teachers store <laughs> and I, I didn't at the time. I do have one now, um, but it's something that I'm still exploring. So right now my resources are, are sold on my website, but I do have a teachers pay teachers store and I'm pretty sure there's a few free resources on there, but it's something that I'm just exploring right now because I, you know, haven't looked into it. But I will say I use Teachers Be Teachers all the time for resources. It's fantastic. And the things that people are creating, it blows my mind. They're so creative. They're so inexpensive in the grand scheme of how much you would spend on a super duper book. Um, no offense, super duper. <laughs> but it's just like, it's and it's very targeted. So you can go in and search inferential thinking, for example. And Put the category tab as speech therapy and all of these resources come up and you can use the filters to filter out. I'm looking for something that's for a seven-year-old or a, a first grader. And then you can kind of whittle down all of the options. There's so many, but it's really, really cool resource. And there's so many amazing therapy resources that I've downloaded and I use all the time in my therapy. So this is a question and maybe you don't know the answer. If I were to create something, let's say using board maker or lesson picks or symbol sticks or some other symbol generating software, and I, so I make this board, can I put it on teachers pay teachers or is it like breaking copyright or something? Do you know how that works? So it's, you have to be very careful about the copyright and the licensing of the images and all of those things. All of the symbol companies have different requirements, right? So like Boardmaker has a different one than Smarty Symbols, um, you know, and some of them you have to have a professional, I don't know if it's called a professional license. I think it is. I think it's called a professional license in order to sell, you know, you have to credit for the images and the fonts. And so it is kind of complicated. I don't know as far as if you want to just have it for free. I don't know about that. I mean, my guess is that it would be okay. Um, another thing is if you create something AAC specific, I would encourage you to, first of all, share it with our Facebook group because I would love to see what you guys are creating and we could put it in the file section and we have started to build quite a decent size file section um, and I would love to add to that. But, you know, you can post to any of these Facebook groups um, and people love when people share free resources. Um, and the nice thing about our community is I feel like there's so much goodwill in just trying to support our cause, our AAC cause. And a lot of the resources are totally free and just in an effort to help bring everybody in the community up um, with, with some great resources. So I would encourage you guys, if you are creating something, figure out a way to share it. You know, it started off when I was starting to make materials. I just started sharing it with other SLPs that I know locally. And then I started sharing it with families and some other practitioners who maybe they weren't speech therapists. And then I was like, you know, like I should really like make this available on my website. Um, and so it's kind of funny how that transition happens, but the end of the day, we just need to make sure that if we're creating something that lots of people are benefiting from it. And I think that that's the beautiful thing about the internet is that we can just share so easily. 
Yeah, but I think we've talked about this before, right? Lead with sharing. You got to ask yourself, is there a reason I shouldn't share this? If not, then I'm going to share it with the world and give this out to help other people. And then it, it comes back on you, right? Uh, and I, bringing it all the way back around to our how we started this conversation, that's sort of what preschool, it's like one of the number one things you learn in preschool is how to share, right? And those preschool teachers are all about sharing. Absolutely. So without further ado, let's head into the interview with Jenna Rayburn Kirk. Hey, Rachel, it's that time of year again. The ASHA convention's coming. I'm so excited to head to Boston and you guys should come visit us. We're going to be at the Newsline booth, booth 331. Please come over and say hello to us. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to ASHA. I, I wish I was going, but if you're like me and you can't go, isn't there some sort of digital goodie bag? Yes. So beginning on November 15th until the end of the year, you can sign up for our ASHA goodie bag giveaway. And it's packed with all types of resources, checklists, how-tos from myself. Um, I have a, a resource that I'm giving away. Uh, Danielle Reed with Sublime Speech, Tracy Sippel, who is a telepractice expert, and many, many more. So go to exceptionaled.com backslash ASHA. ASHA 18. Um, and everybody who signs up also gets access to Newslines News, jobs, education, and blogs. So don't forget to sign up for your free goodie bag. The other exciting thing is that we're giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. So if you come visit us at the booth, we will ask you a simple question about how your experience is going at ASHA, and you will be entered to win our gift card. So you go to the Newsline booth, which is number 331, when you're at ASHA, and then you can sign up if you're not there to get the goodie bag, but you can also talk to the people there at the booth. Yes. So I'm actually going to be there for uh, some of the conference and we're going to be doing live interviews. So if you are our lucky winner, you get the Amazon gift card. And then I'm pretty sure that you're going to be featured on air on our podcast. That's awesome. So once again, that link is exceptionaled.com slash ASHA18. Well, welcome back to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel, joined today by Jenna Rayburn-Kirk. I'm so excited to have her here. She is an all-star on Teachers Pay Teachers, and she has created tons of amazing resources, uh, both for AAC and a lot of other things. Jenna, thank you so much for, for coming today. I'm so excited to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to do what you're doing. Well, I am a full-time school-based speech-language pathologist. I work in Ohio and always have. And I um, went to grad school thinking I was going to do some kind of pediatric speech therapy. And then I almost switched to adults because I had some really great clinical experiences. And then I swapped myself back to a school district and have never left. So I've worked in a couple of different districts. Right now I work full-time as a preschool speech pathologist and I work in a public school. We have all of our kids sent to one preschool building and we have about 250 kids and they range in ability levels and age from three to six. So it's a really kind of nice because I get to concentrate on one age area, even though they have all kinds of disabilities and communication needs. I do really feel like I get to specialize, which a lot of people don't. So I, I love that about it. Yeah. So I started in preschool. Um, so that population is near and dear to my heart. And it's funny because I do a lot of work with AAC now, um, but I'm still kind of working with emerging communicators. Um, so, you know, I might be working with a 10 or 11 year old, but, you know, as far as the, what we're working on, it's a lot of the same things that I was doing in the preschool populations. And I was just in a preschool yesterday and for Halloween. So this is the day after Halloween, the day we're recording this. And I just like, am always reminded how much I love them. They're so cute and everyone was dressed up so adorably I just I couldn't I couldn't get enough of it yeah, how can you be bad yesterday I was managing some behaviors for kids who were having trouble at their Halloween parties and they're like dressed as a pirate and the I took them to the sensory room for a break and they're like dressed as a pirate trying to like you know losing their mind a little bit because there's just only so much you can do out of your normal schedule that makes you feel safe and okay and uh then you're like getting a little tired of the situation and you look over and it's a pirate or a duck who's on the floor throwing <laughs> a holy tantrum and you just laugh at yourself and you're like this is the best job ever i know i really love this age my favorite thing is that kids come into us maybe nonverbal 
that maybe we're the first ones to say, wow, this really looks like maybe your kiddo has autism and here's what that means. And then they go to kindergarten, maybe they're going, you know, with just some intervention support. It's really neat to work in a transdisciplinary team too. We have 16 intervention specialist classroom teachers. We have four speech therapists. And then we have a motor team with for occupational therapists and therapists. Wow. I feel like that's the best thing about our job is being able to collaborate with other professionals. And it sounds like you guys have a really close-knit team, which is really yeah. fantastic. And we're going to talk a little bit later about intervention and implementation. And we're going to talk about AAC and how can we get everybody on board. And one of the ways is through resources. And I want to just touch a little bit on your resources. I think Everybody knows who you are and the amazing resources that you've created. Um, So I just want to ask some questions because I'm so intrigued. I want to know the first resource you ever made. I actually started making resources like a million years ago. This is my ninth year as a speech therapist. So I've got some years, but I'm not, you know, I'm not two seasons yet. Um, And so I started making resources in graduate school. I did like kind of a different externship where my school is on quarter. So instead of spending just one quarter in a school, I spent a whole year and I did literacy intervention for a school that had lost all their title one reading specialists. So another speech therapist and I went into their program and taught some parents and did like a parent coaching model where we did therapy and reading intervention a couple days. And then we taught parents to do it the days we weren't there. So it was really cool. It gave me a lot of experience. And the biggest experience is that I walked in and the only thing they gave me was the login to reading A to Z. And I've got non-reading kindergartners. I had to make a lot of phonological awareness games and we're working on ending sounds and, you know, decoding words and alphabetic principle and all those, you know, reading skills and we didn't have any materials. So I started looking at the internet and my um, supervisor at that time started a website about reading as a speech pathologist. And so it was really cool. And I got to start making materials that way. And so then by the time I finished my CF year, so I graduated did my CF year, and I had made so much stuff. And I'm like, there, these teacher blogs are amazing. You can go on Pinterest and find anything that you need for teaching math. But there's nothing for speech therapists. What is this? Why are we lacking in this? So I just did it. Just started it. And I started making materials. I, I just gave them away on my website for the first six months. I had a donate button. Like, please <laughs> donate oh. for all these materials I'm making. And I, would, I started working. I was working like three jobs at the time, working after school at clinics, trying to pay off my student loans. And I would go to the printer and find my materials. And I was like, wait, people are actually... <laughs> using them because I didn't have like a robust system. They were just on the webs. I didn't know how many people were using them or who was using them or if they thought they were total junk. And I started finding them all over the place and people in my school started telling me they were using them. And I'm like, okay, if I'm going to spend this much of my life, then I need to like make it kind of more serious. And so that's kind of when I, when I started using teachers, paid teachers and um, posting things through email newsletters and just kind of growing, growing a little bit. It turned into a real business instead of just my side gig. I mean, I'd say you have 25,000 <laughs> followers. I know it's crazy. And like four, I think I, I think I've passed the 400 mark on 400 resources. So <gasps> oh my so goodness, amazing. so fun. And I love to do it. It's my husband goes out and tinkers in the garage and I sit on the computer and de-stress like making stuff. You know, I used to be like a crafter and now now I digitally craft. <laughs> <laughs> well, and my first resources were things for like grammatical things. Like I didn't have any grammar resources and I walked in and all these kids have helping verb goals. What am I going to work on? Okay, well, I'm going to make some, you know, peanut butter and jelly verb matching games. And turned out a lot of people needed those. And yeah. I there from there. Well, and there's definitely a lack, right? For some of those things you see kind of pockets where there's nothing. And I felt, I felt the same way, especially early on in my career. I was like, okay, well, I can't find this on the internet or in a book, so I have to make it. And I think that it's, it's so cool, I mean, to see how that can transform, right? How it can yeah. start from just, we all make materials as speech therapists at some level. Some make more than others, some make better than others maybe. Um, but to really see like this is a business and it's it's so cool to hear your story about other people finding your resources at the printer and all these places that's that's so cool and it's super motivating it's we know about motivation we know about antecedent behavior consequence it's so motivating to walk into asha and find somebody to talk to about they've used your stuff and it helped their students so it's it's really rewarding because it's not just my 50 kids on my case that i'm helping i'm helping tons of kids because i'm if i'm helping a thousand speech therapists then i'm helping 5,000 kids. So it really means a lot to me. And I, 
I just, it's so motivating and so rewarding and it's relaxing for me to do too. So it's a, it's a win-win all around. And I think as, you know, 400 products, I'm not making artic, I'm still making articulation, I guess, resources, but I've really changed from what I used to make (laughs) those grammar games to what I'm making now. And I make so many parent handouts because that's what I use every day at work. If I have to explain it more than five times, then I need a handout for it. (laughs) I, they, don't, they can't retain that much information anyway. You go to an IEP meeting or an evaluation and you learn all kinds of stuff. I'm telling you 50 things and you're probably only going to remember one. But if I give you a handout and you take it home, you'll remember it. If I make an AAC resource that you can use at home with your parents, that's so much more meaningful than maybe the way I started making resources. Absolutely. And I think there's two things that come to my wa- mind. One is we all benefit from visual support, right? Yeah. Like, so if we can give parents some visual support during so, the IEP meeting, I think it's it's really effective. And you're right. I mean, we throw a lot at parents at an IEP meeting. And it's not just us, right? It's every person on the yeah. team. Like, you know, word vomits, like present levels and like what you should be doing at home and all these things. So I think that's fantastic. And the other thing that that just reminded me of is a lot of what we talk about on this podcast is just coaching. Like we're just coaching communication partners and we're coaching other SLPs and we're coaching parents. Um, And I think that that's such a huge piece of what we do. You know, we know from research that sitting across the table from a child for 15 minutes a week, it's not going to do the job, right? We need to really be strategic about the time that we're spending and we need to be teaching everybody how to fish, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's such a, it's such a big piece. And especially on this podcast of what we do. One of my favorite resources that I think you just made recently was the door hanger. Can you yeah, talk I just about made that? that. So I've really, you know, there's a lot of things that I make for myself that don't see the light of day for like years <laughs> because I make it really quickly. And of course, there's restrictions on like symbols. I can't just share all of the, you know, PRC symbols or the Toby symbols because of the copyrights on those. So a lot of times things sit in my box. Like I've made this for myself. But I never shared it. And that's kind of one of those things. They're really simple, like free door hanger that you can pop any symbol into. So you just pop the symbol in there and then you print it and hang it around the room, hang it everywhere. Somebody posted on Instagram this week that she had hung it. I think the child was using a wheelchair and had his device and she hung the door hanger right on the front of his tray. So everybody who sees him knows what the word of the week is, what they're working on. And I thought that was so genius. Uh, I love that. And I saw that photo and I definitely liked it on social media. Um, You know, I think that we just need to think creatively about how we can, you know, implement these goals. And I love core word of the week. You have amazing resources for core word of the week. Um, Anybody who listens to this podcast knows how much I love it because I'm always talking about it. Uh, But it just, it just simplifies things. Like it doesn't need to be so overwhelming. And I think that half the reason that people don't get started is because of overwhelm, right? So it's like, if we can make things simple and, you know, your resource absolutely does that um, and shares with everybody. And at the very least, it's a conversation starter. It's like, why does he have, you know, a door hanger that says go on on the front of his wheelchair? What does that mean? And what's that symbol mean? And, oh, I know how we could do that, you know? I think, of course, core word of the week has been used by a lot of people a lot of different ways, but I think my core word of the week resources match what I do. It's like, how am I going to help everybody use that system? So I need notes that go in mailboxes every week, and I need I need to figure out how the motor team's going to use it in the gym, and how my motor team can use it, and how the teacher can use it at circle time, and what's the social activity that they can do that will kind of coordinate those different things. And that, that takes a little coordination, but if, and then the use of a same system every week, I think really helps to be successful because they know what to expect. Just like our students, we like to know what's coming. If I walk into a staff meeting and all of a sudden someone different is there, or there's a bunch of computers out, I'm like, Oh my heavens, what are we doing? Something's different. Something's changed. I'm, I'm anxious instantly. The same thing. If, if I'm going to learn something new, I want to know ahead of time what it's going to be. I want to know the system. I want to know how I'm going to use it. And then just the simplicity of one word every week, I think is just, it just works. And then you learn and then you're using three word utterances you didn't even know you knew because they're the words from the week before, you know, it just, it works so well. Absolutely. And I love that you started kind of touching on some of the strategies that you use because I'd love to talk about, you know, how can we get how can we get the team on board? Um, and I think that resources is one of them, um, you know, having something that people know what to expect. Um, what are some other ways that you use in your schools to get the whole team on board with particularly AAC implementation? 
Yeah, I think it's so hard. It's the hardest part. It's hard for us. It's hard for speech therapists. Yeah. But I was thinking about in the car what I wanted to talk to you about today. And I was, you know, just thinking about my own journey. And I didn't have a course in assistive technology during my graduate or undergraduate programming. And then I got a student one day, he was using a device. And I was like, Oh, boy, I'm over my head. <laughs> what am I gonna do? Um, let me look into this. Let me learn how to turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> Step one, turn it on. <laughs> let me figure out, forget the evidence. Let me figure out how to turn it on and off. So (laughs) it's been a journey for me to learn about assistive technology. And I think it is for all speech therapists. So I think when you're thinking about trying to get your team on board, you have to think about that. We know all the things about language development. We know the developmental norms for which kids gain language. Think about trying to help a kid learn that, but then not having our background. It's so different. It's so overwhelming. And you might have an IEP goal and you're a physical therapist and you need to get the kid to jump off the box. Or take a step down, you know, yeah. in alternating feet. That's what you're working on. So why do you care if there's communication involved? So, and I do think most professionals do care and do realize that how much easier life would be if all their students could communicate to them. But it seems so overwhelming when you look at it from the start. So one of the ways I'm really lucky is that I work in a center that has really strong professionals. And everybody in my center is focused on special education. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those barriers that's kind of reduced for me. But I do think just modeling for them in a way that isn't saying, here, use this device for everything all the time. It's those baby steps to introducing it. When you think about how I started using it with my first turn, it was like, okay, I found the word stop and go. And that's what I used for the first day because I found them on the home screen really easy. Right. And then I went and did research and figured out how to practice and downloaded the software so I could practice at home. And If you think about introducing it for a team like that, I think that really works. Like if you're going to work with an occupational therapist, teaching them the colors is so easy because they do so many fine motor activities that include cutting and pasting and drawing and crayons. And that's such an easy entry area. So I think it's about finding the entry area for each profession and domain. Like if you're going to do motor team, stop and go is a great one. Start there, up and down, stop and go, bam, four words that could make a big difference and get, get the kiddo really using it in that area. And the teacher, you could pick a book or do something at circle time and kind of finding the, the waiting area of the pool to wade into that, I think really helps. Exactly. And I think, I think exactly what you're saying is we need to be specific right? I always tell that to, to new clinicians and to the people that I, I do trainings with is that we need to be specific and tell people exactly what to do. Um, so if we can give specific vocabulary, you know, like stop and go is a perfect one because um, people feel overwhelmed, right? And, and I also think that people feel like they're going to do it wrong. There's this idea that like there's one way to do it, um, you know, and of course we know there's guidelines for modeling and prompting and all these things, but it's not, it, it's better to, you know, quote unquote, do it wrong. I don't even know what that means, but mm-hmm. then to not do it at all. Right. Yeah. So, and, and that's the thing is you kind of have to dive right in and, and you learn as you go. So I think that that's something that's really important to articulate to team members is let's just get started and let's keep it simple. Um, and I, I frequently will give one word, uh, to, to a teacher that's like, I don't really know. We're not using the device. And you know, they're kind of all up in arms and stressed. And they're like, I know I'm supposed to be using it. I'm not. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, let's take a deep breath. Let's just focus on all done, you know, instead of having him throw himself on the ground when he's upset and he doesn't want to keep going on in an activity, let's just model all done. After every activity is finished, we're just going to say all done, um, you know, and try to really simplify that for, for parents and teachers because I think it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah, it can be really overwhelming. And as I'm sitting here almost a decade into my career, knowing what I know now, It sounds a lot easier to say, but uh, just a few years ago when I started at this location, I, we tried to do like a lunch and learn period where we had iPads for everybody and we had all these activities. We were going to have them work on requesting food. It was going to be a teacher training. No one showed up. Zero (gasps) percent attendance. Oh no. (laughs) It's not that easy. Even if you work in the best place, which I do and work with people who really want to work on something hard and new for them, it's still it's like a mental thing. So you, you have to try and try again and try again. So I think if whatever you try the first time, if, even if teaching all done, she does it one day and then she puts that thing back on the shelf and it's never seen the light of day all week, the rest of the week, you go in the next time and it still says all done, all done, all done across the top. Then the next week you got to try something different. You have to go about it at a different way 
and try to really reach those team members who maybe are a little resistant to it. So I, I, sometimes I tell that story, not because I want everyone to go, Oh my gosh, that probably was terrible. You planned all that work and did all that. And then no one showed up. Well, that's not the point of that. The point is, okay, it's not the way these, the staff is going to welcome that information. How am I going to do it in a different way? So I think, I think you just have to be flexible for that. The other thing I always try to think about is how am I going to solve a problem for them? Because they are overworked. Mm -hmm. they are overwhelmed and they have too many people on their caseload and they are dealing with a lot of things too. So if you present your information as a solution to their problem, maybe one of their biggest problems, you know, if he could tell you what, what would make your life easier? If he could tell you he needed a diaper change. Okay, great. We can work on that. Or that he's hungry or that he's all done. What is it? What could I do? What would be the one thing that would make a difference in how your everyday classroom runs? That is the number one question I ask new referrals. I said, and if I go into a, a classroom, I say, if I had a magic wand and I could give you one thing, what would it be? And yeah. sometimes it's not even, it's not even really communication related, right? It's like potty training or whatever, but at least then I have an idea as to like, okay, here's top priority. How can I somehow weave in communication into this problem? Or what about lack of communication is causing this problem? Right. Um, because a lot of times we know that kids aren't able to protest and tell us the things that they don't want. And mm -hmm. that's when you see them falling on the ground or crying or throwing or, you know, self-injurious behavior or whatever it is. So I think that that's such an important question question to ask. Um, and also, we just need to be really supportive. The parents and the teachers and the other SLPs, you know, we're all really busy. We all have a ton on our plates. So I'm always very kind, even if I'm like, really? The device still isn't being used? Mm -hmm. this yeah. uh, you know, I still go in and I'm like, okay, like how can I, how can I make this easier for you? Like how can we set something up so that you're able to do it and feel good about it? Um, yeah. Because it's not always just come in and here's what you do. And then they, they hit the ground running very often. It's not that. So it's really trying to brainstorm. How can I make this approachable and doable for a communication partner? Right. Yeah. And I, I think building a relationship, like a friendship, even if there's their number one complaint is something about behavior that you don't really think is impacted by, you know, maybe it's sensory that you think is really causing that or something else that maybe it's that the kid never eats breakfast. I don't know, whatever medicine they're on, even if it's something you can't control, just the giving them the chance to emote that, <laughs> to get, get it off their chest, to be like, oh, you're not going to believe this. This mom can't give the kid the medication every day because of X, Y, and Z at home. So every other day he's on his meds and okay, great. I'm, that sounds horrible. I understand how frustrating that meet might be. And then to kind of like go in deeper to what you're trying to steer the <laughs> conversation to, but you know, just some of that personal connection, I think goes a long way to trying things. Yeah. And we're all so busy, right? That it's like, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't have time. I only have a certain amount of time. But then I think, okay, take a deep breath, chill out, Rachel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have time to have, you know, a connection with somebody, right? You have time yeah. to, to talk about something that, you know, for whatever reason is coming up for that person right now. Um, yeah. So I think it's definitely important and definitely um, you get a lot out of that. It doesn't yeah. feel like when you think about it, it's like, oh, like that was a waste of time. It actually wasn't because if you have somebody that trusts you, then all of a sudden they're, they're more apt to do the things that you, you know, would like them to do or that you're teaching them. And then that connection and that relationship is so important from a long-term perspective to get the outcomes that we want, right? Yeah. I totally agree. So let's talk a little bit about AAC and the preschool population because you have a very unique experience in a lot of kids are coming and they are nonverbal, right? And they had never been to school before. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what is the age in which you would recommend AAC? I know without even asking that you probably get some pushback from some parents and some teachers about implementing too early. We know there's a lot of myths surrounding, you know, AAC and it's stopping kids from talking and all these things. So I would just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I call myself the recruitment team because I do our incoming evals. And I work on a play-based uh, transdisciplinary evaluation team that does evals every week. And we usually do maybe like 120 a year. So we have a lot of evals to do every year. So that's a chance every week for me to get to know these parents who are coming in you know, at a various level of acceptance and kind of knowledge and interest in AAC and communication. And the, and the interesting thing is that 
so many of our kids are so severely impacted by a lot of different things. It's not just our multiply handicapped kids who we're looking at AAC for. We've got severe phonology kids or ch- kids with childhood apraxia of speech who are practically nonverbal because all they're saying are vowels and we cannot mm-hmm. understand a single part of it unless right. mom is there to translate like that. We, ah, it means I was an alligator for Halloween last night. Like, okay, none of us got that, but mom knows and the kid's shaking his head yes. And I believe you that that's what he said, but I don't speak vowels <laughs> a little bit, but I need context. Um, exactly. And so we, we really use assistive technology. I bet if you look at my like ratio of amount of kids that I check the assistive technology required on the IEP, initial IEP box compared to any of our elementary schools, it's crazy different because yeah, if this kid has got a practice that's so impacted, yes, he needs assistive technology. And right now we're going to put it on the IEP. We're not going to wait to see what he needs. And no, we're going to put it on there so that it's marked in case Johnny moves to the next district over that they know they need some kind of system for him. So we have a lot of kids who I call like our short term, short term kids, you know, they're on a short term assistive technology plan. We're just doing it until we can get them a little bit intelligible or till we find out what we think is going on. Are they going to be a nonverbal kid or is it just that I've never, Ever had therapy and I have autism and oh wow a year later we have words coming out everywhere that kind of thing so it's really mm-hmm. interesting I really like it so we use a lot of different technology a lot of low-tech core boards some pecs with some of our kiddos we use a lot of picture choice boards just as a preschool support preschool mm-hmm. is so visual literally there's a visual for everything how to wash your hands how to pull up and down your pants in the bathroom how to sign in at the coat check everything in the whole entire building <laughs> has a visual how to walk into the gym there's a visual everything is supported so we have a lot of those so you'll find you go into our cafeteria that our tables all have visual supports stuck to them we just have a lot of picture choice boards that we use for a lot of our students and then we do more specific um, like go talk nines and big math buttons and single speech generating device, different options. We don't have too many kids who are in, um, who are non-ambulatory. So we don't have a whole lot of adapting to chairs and that kind of stuff um, because most of them are still dealing with Medicaid or whatever it is to get their funding for those kind of supports to that kind of assistive technology. We have iPads that have you know, more robust systems. Mm-hmm. We really have the gamut. It's really fun. The hard thing about assistive technology, of course, is that these kids change so fast. By the time we've written a plan and done something, they're different. You know, in yeah. a year, a school year, if we if we get a kid in October or November right now, by the time we would request and try to get a device for them and do that kind of stuff outside of ourselves, they might be a different kind of kiddo by that time. You know, it's hard at yep. this age. So we have a lot of resources within our building that we can use and let families use. And I think that really is nice because there is a waiting game, of course, in assistive technology, but we can kind of, we fill the gap, which I think is really nice. We're not spending a whole year waiting to get something in this kid's hand. And we have in Ohio, we have really nice lending libraries that we can borrow from. So if we need some other kind of device or system to trial, we can do that. So that's nice. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head, especially with preschool populations in general. Mm -hmm. It's like the amount of development that happens from a language standpoint is huge. Even from just three-year-old to a four-year-old. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. Someone with any kind of disability in communication. And yes, I've had that experience so many times. It's like by the time we like wrote the report, we did the assessment, we wrote the report, like we got the device. I was like, well, he's talking now. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But, you know, it's really great to hear that you're using a lot of low-tech supports and um, and also some high-tech stuff, too. What's the, the indicator for you that you need to potentially transition a child from a low-tech support, like a communication board or PECS, to a high-tech device? I think it really depends on how fast therapy is going and how responsive to you know developing that plan it becomes. I don't know. It just feels pretty natural that... Even when I evaluate a kid, a lot of times I'll say to a parent, you know, I I think we should start here, but I think we're very quickly going to try this. If I see the need for a kiddo to be on using an iPad or a device for more than, I don't know, six months, I think we need to start looking at something more robust because if that is going to be their long-term device, then I want it to be robust and something that they can grow into. I'm not going to make the plan for what they are at right now, of course, because maybe they only came in with five words and we're not going to be stuck here forever. So it's, I think that's one of those things that just becomes an 
intuition and probably isn't really an intuition is a skill that we've developed. Um, my colleagues and I, that we are like, okay, this doesn't look like, you know, we're not making any progress. We still can't get imitating bilabials. I don't think we're going to be talking about a kiddo who's walking and talking at kindergarten. I think we need to make a better plan for that. And so we just kind of, I don't know. I don't think we have a set system, but we just kind of feel it out. Yeah. And I think that that's where clinical experience comes into play. Right. And it's like, it's just like, you kind of like have this feeling like, you know, uh, we're not making the gains that we need to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm constantly trying to think long-term because, you know, it is important to figure out what's happening right here and right now and figure out the supports that we need. But like, we also need to be thinking a big picture, especially when it comes to AAC. Um, you know, if we have any inclination that this is going to be more of a long-term solution and not just let's get a few more consonants in and then we'll be able to understand, then I think it's really important to kind of set up that plan. And the earlier, the better, because a lot of the kids that I'm seeing, it's really late when they're being introduced to AAC. It kind of baffles me at some level. I'm like, really? And sometimes they, they weren't even exposed to PECs. I'm like, well, what have we been doing? It's like, oh, like they had an approximation of a sign. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, none of them were 10 words, but what about the rest of the thousands of words in our language? Yeah. Exactly. One of the things that I think also has helped is that assistive technology has gotten relatively cheaper. So mm-hmm. districts are a lot more willing to buy things. And I think we have we can now prove how this is important. Like if we have a severely impaired apraxic kiddo or a kiddo with a cleft palate who's so severe that you can't understand them, and we know that it's going to be years of therapy before this speech is remediated, well, if we don't give a device and grow the language, now we got a bigger problem because now we don't have language either. We don't have exactly. speech or language, and we can't just wait until they're eight and now their cleft palate surgeries are resolved and now we have speech, you know? So I think it's really different in the preschool setting because you're thinking about what do you know about how long it takes to remediate a typical disorder or profile of a kid and then how important is it to take the time to teach that device that's the other thing you're making that decision a clinical decision it's worth teaching the device so this child has a language system while i'm working every day of the week on speech sound development because they have childhood apraxia of speech too so I think yeah. there's like there's a give and take there. And most of our speech sound disorder kids are not that severe, but we have a good handful of them in our building. And so that's been kind of one of those things that I think I've been learning through and working through and talking to other people in other districts. But but really when I sit down and talk to a parent, and we you asked this question earlier, but the parent conversation is a big part of it. Parent buy-in, trying to get them on my team for why this is important is huge. But I think if you explain that way, like Yes, we, we know you want your kid to talk. I want your child to talk too. It would be so much easier if you could say, I want chicken nuggets rather than have to do it on a device or a board for chicken nuggets. But um, if he doesn't grow his language at the same time, by the time we get those speech sounds, we're going to be in big trouble because he's not going to know how to say a sentence or make a grammatically correct sentence. And right now his brain is a sponge and we have to get this, you know, this language development window you have to use it so much. So that's a lot of the explanation I give to parents. And I talk a lot about how much evidence there is, just like for sign language. A lot of them have come in and they've bought into, okay, if I work with sign, then maybe they'll start saying words. And I try to use that like, okay, so same thing with the device. If we start, if we get your kiddo, yes, you just got a brand new autism diagnosis. And all you want him to do is tell you he loves you and say, hi, mommy. But if we work with a device or, or any other kind of technology first, you know, we have, we have evidence that that's going to help grow that. And so a lot of times if they've bought into the sign language thing from the birth to three program, I can kind of buy into that same idea. Come over to this side now. <laughs> Come, to my side. Come with me. <laughs> no, I completely agree. And I always tell parents um, and clinicians, there's no reason to stunt expressive language development while we wait for speech sounds. It does not have to be one or the other. Um, we can be doing both simultaneously. And that's what we should be doing as clinicians. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of where I think the clinical decision-making comes in. You have to think through the lens of, and, and it's hard with these kids with severe articulation you know, and phonological disorders and apraxia in, in these things. What are they trying to say? Are they at a three-word or four-word phrase, but you just can't understand any of it? Um, or are they stuck using single words? Because that's a really big 
big indicator as to where their expressive language is at. And I think that that's a huge piece when we're thinking about AAC. Um, we really need to make sure that we're expanding these kids' utterances and teaching them the language so that when their speech sounds come in, you know, we're, we're, we're ready to go. We're ready to like hit the ground running. Um, and we're not picking up where, you know, so far behind. Well, one of the other things I think that we use to help convince parents, and maybe when you think about it for our kids who are more significantly impacted because they're on the autism spectrum, sometimes those kids teach their parents that they need it. And I love that because we'll say, you know, if we have a parent who's giving some pushback about putting assistive technology on the initial IEP, and the initial IEP is so general, it says literally everything from low tech to high tech, we're going to have it available and see what works for your kiddo. And then at the next IEP, we'll have a much better, clearer picture. Heck, at the first parent-teacher conference, we're going to be able to tell you what he's using. Mm -hmm. But we use that kiddo. Like at a parent-teacher conference, one of my colleagues just told me a story about how she had one of her kiddos, she pulled out the iPad and he went over and told his mom something. I think, I don't remember what he said to her, but at parent-teacher conference, the mom's like, he can do that? I'm like, yeah, look, he can tell you something. Isn't this amazing? We're not just making that data up that we send home every week. We promise he's doing this. And then that buys, that gets the parent buy-in piece to it too, which can help. I think just seeing, you know, the proof of it, that it works so well, especially for our kids with autism. Um, you can't beat it. That feeling of my kid doesn't talk at home at all, except for that weird ticka, ticka, ticka noise that he always makes in the corner that they all make. I'm like, yeah, I know, but look what he's doing at school. Look at these words he's saying. And we send videos home and we try, we try to get the kids to be the, the heavy hammer <laughs> that convinces them. Exactly. Yeah, I just did an assessment and this little boy had a few words, but not using them functionally really um, sometimes. And within 15 minutes of swinging on the swing, he wanted to be pushed. And so I was working on go. And this little guy got off the swing, came over to hit go on the device. And like everyone was floored. You know, the ABA therapists were like, whoa, look, we can't believe that. He got mm -hmm. off the swing to come talk. I'm like, see, he's motivated. He you got to find that motivator. Yeah, exactly. But it was such a great experience. I'm like, well, that's all the buy-in I need. <laughs> he convinced them. Exactly. exactly. You can just get him to do that when every kid, when you do the eval, <laughs> that I doesn't know. Really work out. we know that. And there are kids who we send the video and the mom's like, he's never done that with his device at home. But you know, yeah. eventually, you know, there's usually a moment that they get that buy-in, which is nice. Exactly. Uh, well, listen, Jenna, it's been really great talking. Before we go, I always ask one question to all the people that we have on. Um, if you had a billboard that every SLP saw, what would it say? I think if I was going to make an SLP billboard, it would just be the word Pataka, really big in the sky with no reference. And everyone in the city would be like, what does that mean? And we would just be like, Pataka, oh my gosh, how funny. That is so, an inside That's joke for all the mean. SLPs. <laughs> yeah, and we would have the knowledge and then they would actually ask us things. There's yeah. all those commercials, right? There's one about a nurse giving the kid the assistive technology device to learn to talk. Have you seen that commercial? Because no. I think we are well underrepresented in, in the field. And like when you watch Grey's Anatomy and all those places where they just, they forget about us. It's always a nurse or a doctor who did the speech therapy. I'm like, okay. I don't think any doctors are doing the speech therapy activity. So I think if we just had a little inside secret, that would be awesome. Speaking to that point, actually, that show Atypical, I don't know if you've seen that. It's I a, love that show. Yeah. I love it too. But you know, that it's, it's a, the, the woman who is like the therapist, she's like a psychologist. I'm like, come on, I can't be a speech therapist. You can't, you can't have any social group that's run by a speech therapist. Exactly. Like, no what psychologists are running speech therapy groups or right? no social groups. Maybe a school counselor, but I don't think. So. No. We, we so could have been very mis- or underrepresented, I guess is the right word. And I feel like it'd be super cool for us to have a secret. So absolutely. Well, I love that. Um, before we leave, Jenna, how can people find you online? I know that they can go to Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, you're under Speech Room News, but what's your website? Yeah, you can go to my website. It's thespeechroomnews.com. And you can find me on Instagram. That's where I hang out the most. I'm everywhere. If you just search Jenna Rayburn Kirk or Speech Room News. But if you find me at Speech Room News on Instagram, that's where I am. I'd love to chat more about assistive technology. Yeah. Well, I love uh, following you and all that you do. And um, I'm, I'm hoping, are you going to be at ASHA? Are you gonna be I'm going to be at ASHA. Yeah, I'm super excited. I'm going to be at a booth. I'm not presenting this year. The weird thing about working in a school is that a uh, progress report or do the week of ASHA every year. And so every year when I present, I feel so overwhelmed. So in the, in the uh, spirit of self-care this year, 
I did not apply to present. I'm really happy about that, but I'm going and I'm going to be at a booth. So yeah, people can find me. I think it's booth 356. Well, I will definitely come find you. I'm going to meet Asha yeah. and yeah. I can definitely, I can definitely relate. I am presenting at Asha and feel the, the crunch. Mind crunch. Yep. I'm like, okay, it's two so weeks. I like presenting at Asha. You're like, oh my gosh, did I just present at the national conference? But <laughs> the week before and probably the week after your brain is a little scrambly. So yeah. I took this year off, maybe next year. Yeah. Well, listen, Jenna, it's been so wonderful having you on our show. I can't wait for this episode to release. Um, I just really appreciate all of your time and your insight. Um, You're doing amazing things and creating amazing resources that I know everybody can benefit from. Um, So much so that you've been willing to give give us a a giveaway, one of your core word of the week. Um, So we'll have to figure out all the rules around who's going to win that. But I'm really excited because I know what wonderful resources you have. I use them. I, I download them and I use them. um, And I really appreciate all of the work that you're doing. Well, I really appreciate being on a podcast. It's super fun. And I enjoy listening to you guys. One of the best technology advances, I think, in our field is the way that we're getting content delivered to us as professionals. You know, you don't have to go to ASHA. It's awesome to go to ASHA. But the nitty gritty, how do I do this? How do I make this work is available in podcasts and blogs. And, you know, there are so many mediums, Facebook groups and There's just so much access now that we never had before, even when I was in graduate school 10 years ago. So I'm super thankful for for you guys putting all this information out. Like we said, communication barriers, you know, happen in a lot of ways, but hopefully in our field, the way we're disseminating the information about how how to handle these hard kiddos is really improving. Absolutely. It's never been easier to do professional development, right? Right. Love it. Only we got credit. Only we got credit for listening to podcasts. I don't know how to go about that, but... I feel like it's coming. It's got to be coming. It's definitely coming. Um, hopefully with our podcast, actually. So I love we, that. yeah, yeah. Just take a little test and listen to our podcast, take a little test and you get CEUs. Awesome. Um, what better way to, to get all the professional development that you need? Well, thank you again so much, Jenna, for talking with tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel. We will talk to you guys next week. Well, welcome back. That was awesome. I had no idea. I really had no idea. I learned so much from that. Thank you for doing that and reaching out to her, Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, definitely go on Teachers Pay Teachers. Her resources are great, um, especially the the door hanger that she talked about. Um, it You can put any core word in there. So if you're doing core word of the week, which I we've already talked about how great of a strategy that is um, when you're implementing core words, uh, it's just such a great resource and it's totally free. Um, and speaking of free, we actually have a giveaway uh, coming up. Jenna was so nice to donate a core word of the week resource um, for one of our lucky listeners. So if you haven't joined our Facebook group group already, please do join because that's where we're going to be posting the details for the giveaway. Um, It's, it's fantastic resource and it's totally free if you win. So please join our Facebook group if you haven't already. Am I, am I eligible? Can I win? (laughs) Well, you'll have to sign up, Chris. (laughs) I'm already in the Facebook group. <laughs> well, you're going to have to sign up for the whatever else needs to happen. Can we review our own podcast? I'm not sure how that works. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think there's, that's ethical. No, that's no, a, that's probably a not. Actually ethical violation, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, if you haven't left us a review, we're trying to get to 100 reviews by 2019. We are currently at 65, which I'm really excited about. I feel like we started, we've, we've doubled what, we had when we started this about a month ago. So please do go leave us a review. I want to read one from Stein AAC. It really touched my heart. He says, Lucas, Rachel, and Chris do such an incredible job. Thank you, all three of you, for making this available to SLPs all over the world. These podcasts are so good. I often have to listen twice, once in my car and a second time in my home where I can take notes. My favorite podcast by far. Thank you again. Just amazing. That is awesome. That is so awesome. I just love the fact that people take the time to actually write that stuff out. And, you know, I think one of the reasons um, sometimes people feel like a little intimidated about reading reviews, they don't know what to write. I want to make a quick suggestion here. One thing that you could write in a review is just say happy birthday because our podcast has turned a year old. Uh, On the date of this recording, it's a Friday, November 2nd. And our first episode, I think, dropped November 1st a year ago. Is that right, Rachel? 
It is. And, you know, I'm so sad that Lucas isn't here so we can all celebrate together. Um, but yeah, I remember, I remember a year ago when we just started this thing and I thought, sure, like I'll be a part of an AAC podcast. Sounds right up my alley. Um, and to think about all how far we've come. Um, we've had amazing interviews the last year with thought leaders in our industry. And it's just so exciting to see how this podcast has really taken off. And so many of you guys are listening and, and downloading and subscribing and joining our group. And it's just so, it's so cool to, to be a part of it. And writing reviews and sharing and subscribe. Did you say subscribing? You said subscribing, subscribing, <laughs> which is free. Yes, it's free. Hit the subscribe so you don't miss all the episodes. Thank God I'm su subscribed because sometimes I'm like, can't even figure out what day of the week it is. Um, and I get a little notification. I'm like, oh, our episode's up. Um, and I listen to it. I listen to all of our episodes again because a lot of times it's such great information. I, I really listen to it, um, you know, as a way to reinforce kind of the things that we talked about. And especially with all of the amazing interviews that we have, these people are bringing such amazing ideas to our audience and it's just so exciting to to listen so i always listen on on tuesdays when we we drop the episode <laughs> me too me too i listen to uh and I, sometimes i i get my kids to listen and they we all talk about the episodes afterwards and have questions it's, it's a family friendly show so feel free to share it with your family <laughs> amazing all right thanks everybody and thank you rachel and we'll see you next week You're listening to the Exceptional Podcast Network.